for, for all of those, all of you um, um, joining us now, we're going to begin right on the hour with Dan's talk. So I'll give my brief introduction to Dan uh, right now. Um, Dan Whitehouse is Daniel Whitehouse is an ERC, ESRC postdoctoral fellow based here at SOAS in the Department of Anthropology and Sociology. Um, his research is concerned with the cultural legacy of informal colonialism in Thailand, the anthropology of elites, and institutional ethnography. He's currently writing Learning to Govern, an historical ethnography of uh, Suan Kulab uh, Wittialai, the uh, so called Eden of Thailand. Before studying his PhD at Durham University, Daniel is a uh, broadcast journalist at Voice TV, a Thai language news channel based in, um, in Bangkok. These seminars, um, uh, and to give our own plug, these seminars come from the uh, Center for Southeast Asian Studies uh, at SOAS, and we do um, the, uh, we, we often have afternoon, evening seminars, but we do these other seminars at uh, noon so that we can reach hopefully as much of an audience in Asia as well as we possibly can because of the, the, the time difference. Now we have just reached noon, so I'm gonna invite Dan to begin his talk. Thank you, Dan. Um, well, thank you very much, Michael. And um, thank you um, to everyone that zoomed in today to listen to me uh, talk for an hour or so about elite networks in um, Thailand. I'm so glad that so many of you could make it, including I think quite a number of people I'm from Thailand, so um, that's wonderful. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, the title of my talk today is The Good Men of Suan Gulap, Network Politics at an Elite Thai School. And this is based on um, principally my PhD thesis, which I submitted um, last year at, to the University of Durham. And it draws from fieldwork that I conducted from 2019 to 2020 um, in central Bangkok. And I'd like to begin um, the presentation today, if I may, by relaying a story that occurred during fieldwork, as anthropologists who want to do. And specifically, I want to relay a story that when it happened, it first got me interested in looking at this extraordinary school, Sun Gulab Wittialai. Particularly, it drew my attention to the fact that this might be a significant and perhaps overlooked institution within the wider political infrastructure of modern Thailand. So the incident in question um, took place when I was attending a um, charitable gala in Bangkok a few years ago, and it was a, a sort of black tie, rather stuffy affair at a very smart hotel. And I found myself sat at a very large dining room table surrounded by older men. Um, all of whom were unfamiliar to me, but who were sort of chatting animatedly amongst themselves. And I was sort of, I sat there and nodded, not really understanding what they were talking about. And then the diner to my left broke away from this group discussion. And he explained that the all the men around the table were old school friends that they were the alumni of a prestigious um, all boys school based in the old town of Bangkok called Suan Kula Bwithialai. And I sort of nodded and, and smiled and I made some comment that um, it was quite remarkable that these men seemed so intimate with one another after what must be many decades since they graduated. They were all beyond the age of retirement, well beyond the age of retirement. And the man sort of narrowed his eyes and started to nod vigorously. And he said, at Suan Gulap, our school friends are our brothers, Robin Pinong Gan. And we rely on our brothers to show loyalty. And then he asked me the question that you see on the slide in front of you. He said, my old headmaster used to tell us a story 
as soon Gulat Man finds himself alone on a dark and unknown road. It's raining and his vehicle is dead. He needs help. What should he do? Now, I didn't know the answer to this question. So the man told me and he said, he must sing the Suan Gulap song and then a brother will appear and his car will be fixed and his belly will be filled because Suan Gulap brothers are bound to help one another. And this comment um, sort of really intrigued me uh, as an anthropologist. And we pretty much spent the rest of the evening talking about this very extraordinary community of alumni. And at one point, uh, one of the men in the around the table um, took out his phone and he showed me on his screen this very distinct uh, pink and blue symbol that you see before you. And he said, this is the emblem of my school. This is where I studied and this is where my brother studied and this is where my sons studied. This is the golden ticket. So what I want to do in this presentation today is I want to give you a brief impression of why the alumni of Suan Kulap believe that attendance to their school uh, represents a golden ticket to public life and why we as scholars of the region should be looking at institutions like Suan Kulap um, with more care if we are to understand with more nuance how um, power and resources are distributed in contemporary Thailand. So um, considering that we've got um, not too long today, uh, I'm gonna restrict my um, presentation to just quite a small um, section of my wider research project. And I'm gonna focus primarily on the history of this school and the history of its alumni community, um, particularly the emergence of the alumni community as a network institution. Um, and this is a term that I'm gonna come back to later on. So I'm gonna begin with a brief introduction to Suan Gulap and where is it? Um, how did it come to be? Um, what is it? And then I want to introduce excuse me, the concept of um, the network institution. And what I want to do here is try to convince you that this concept um, might be a useful theoretical and methodological mechanism for helping us understand um, the infrastructure of a political, uh, the political infrastructure of contemporary Thailand. And I also want to nominate um, Soon Gulap as a sort of quintessential idea of what the network institution is and how it operates. And finally today, uh, I wanna end by um, suggesting that the considerable influence of places like Soon Gulap are not necessarily um, a sort of modern expression of deep-rooted, pre-modern political cosmologies. And that, in fact, at Suan Gulap, these networks are based, at least in part, on a highly charismatic institutional culture um, that has developed at the school over the last hundred years or so. And this charismatic culture is steeped in the cultural apparatus that were developed in England, in the top flight schools of England, the Eaton's, Harrow's and Winchester's, at a time of high colonization, at the time of the height of the British Empire. And the, the, they were then imported into Siam, um, where they accrued new local meanings, 
which managed to exert these really powerful fraternal bonds over the alumni community. So what is Suun Gulap Butialai? So Suun Gulap was founded in 1881 by Prince Damrong. Um, at this time, Prince Damrong was only 25 and he put been put in command of the Royal Pages. And this was a very prestigious regiment that attended to the personal needs of the monarch. It was for the younger sons of the nobility, essentially. And he established the school specifically for this regiment. He established it within the, royal, the walls of the royal palace itself. And it was to teach this regiment basic literacy and numeracy, because these were not skills that traditionally the nobility deemed it necessary to acquire. This was for clerks and for pen pushers. Um, but at this time, Prince Damrong's brother, older half-brother, King Chulongkorn, was making very big bureaucratic changes to the structure of the administrative system in Thailand. And now he needed administrators who could read and write documents. Um, the school was very successful, so much so that in the second year, there were more applications to the school than there were vacancies in the Royal Pages Regiment. So Prince Damrong and the King made the decision to transform the school into a civilian school in, 18, in 1882, um, albeit one that was still restricted to the nobility. Mom Ratawong, Mom Luang. And the school um, kind of grew exponentially from this point, um, so much so that by 1911, it had sort of outgrown the royal palace and moved to its current location at the Ratchaburana Temple, which is about a 10 minute walk from um, the royal palace, just next to the Jaupriya River. It currently teaches about 3000 boys, um, aged 12 to 17. And this is um, grade Matillon 1, to seven. And perhaps one of the most salient and um, recognizable features of Suun Gulap is its ability to churn out highly successful alumni. So one of the things that all alumni of Suun Gulap will tell you with some pride is that the school has produced eight prime ministers, uh, which is no small feat considering um, the first prime minister only came to office in 1932 in Thailand. Um, but beyond prime ministers, um, we see um, Sungulat members in sort of every area of Thai public life. So, for example, um, the school has produced um, three Privy Council presidents, five attorney generals, nine Supreme Court justices, 13 education ministers, um, two um, Fortune 500 global CEOs. So we're talking here really about a community that is at the very heart of the Thai state. And when I talk about Soon Gulap to um, a lot of my English friends who are not familiar with the school, they often say, oh, well, it's like the Eton of Thailand. And in many ways, this is a very apt comparison. And we're going to look a little bit at, at that later on, why that might, might be the case. But actually, there are some very important differences between Soon Gulap and the sort of great public schools of Britain. First of all, unlike Eton, for example, Soon Gulap is and always has been state administered. It is not independent of the state. It is also not fee paying. So it is selective. Uh, entrance is granted to students who pass um, a very highly competitive examination. Um, um, most, and most of these successful students will have done some kind of private preparation uh, at, a, at a private school, most of which are actually run by Sungulap graduates. Um, some parents are invited to be donors of the school. And if they are successful, their children don't have to pass the exam. But by and large, um, this is a selective state, non-fee paying day school. Um, another salient aspect of the OSK community, OSK standing for Old Soon Gulap, or the alumni of Soon Gulap, 
is that they are very well known to be highly devoted to their alma mater. And um, for some people, this can border on almost cultish behavior. I remember that one of my very first interviews in Bangkok was with a retired military officer. He was an air chief marshal uh, in his day. And um, he, he arrived for our interview wearing a Soon Gulak t-shirt, pink and blue, a Soon Gulak cap, two Soon Gulak silicone bracelets around his wrists, and a belt whose buckle had welded to had welded to it OSK in giant metallic letters. And I thought that he was wearing this outfit in sort of deference to our interview. He knew we were going to be talking about the school. And so he wore this outfit. And I, I mentioned this to him. And he looked at me quite confused. And he said, with total seriousness, I wear pink and blue every single day. In fact, the only time I don't wear pink and blue is when I'm going to a funeral, unless it's an OSK funeral, in which case I'll uh, wear pink and blue. And uh, after meeting many OSK, I have to say this isn't that extreme. Um, a lot of alumni to the school have a very close emotional and even material connection to the school. So, for example, there's a really thriving market for OSK branded products. You can see in the top right hand corner there, um, this is a, a registration car plate, number plate that has the letters OSK. And there are so many items like this that you can wear on your body or on, your, on objects that sort of allow alumni to identify one another within the public realm. Um, on the top right hand corner as well is um, a, a Sungula amulet, um, pink and blue, obviously. Um, and this is impressed with the guardian spirit of the school, um, Suan Pa Sungula. And the wearer of this would not only be identifiable as a Sungula alumni, but he also would um, deem the amulet capable of imbuing him with some kind of personal cosmic protection from the, um, the guardian spirit of the school. And a lot of the Sungalap materials are seen to be invested with this sort of sacrity, um, this idea of sanctity. Um, also, you can see a picture of a sort of um, a cowboy in profile. This is um, the emblem of the Sungulap Gun Club. And um, this is just one of hundreds of gun clubs, I uh, mean gun clubs, excuse me, Sungulap clubs um, that exist within the wider network. And these can be based on hobbies like golf or guns. They could be based on the year that you graduated, or they could be based on your um, professions or careers. So for example, every arm of the military will have its own Sungulap group. And many alumni are members of several of these groups. It's not unusual for alumni to spend a large portion of their social lives interacting exclusively with members who also attended the same school as them. And these bonds are also um, kind of regularly strengthened by a very busy ritual calendar that takes part at the school. I won't have time to talk about these really fascinating rituals today, um, but you can see just on the left hand side here at the bottom left, this is an interesting ritual that takes place at the beginning of the academic year in which old alumni who graduated from the school 50 years prior, return to the school. They dress in school uniform and they ritually initiate the first years who are entering the school um, that year. So all of these things um, make up this, this wider sense of what an OSK is. Now, this intense identification with the school has been noted by many commentators. So the historian Chan Witgesed Suri who himself attended um, Sun Gulap and who is a very proud OSK, um, refers to this intense uh, affiliation with the school as the Sun Gulap disease, Rog Sun Gulap, um, which I, I really like this term because it has this um, sort of pathological connotation uh, to it. Um, and he writes in some of his more personal writings, Chan Witt writes that his own father 
had the Zuengulak disease. He attended the school in the 1930s. And um, Charmwit writes that one day um, the ch his childhood home was damaged by fire and he came back to find that his father had repainted the walls pink and blue. Um, such was the depth of his affiliation with the school. And um, Charmit also says that his father would often take him to the school when he was young to, quote, soak up Suun Gulapness. And this concept of Suun Gulapness is really important because it represents a sort of shared values of the community, it's sort of moral nucleus. And the properties of Suun Gulapness are known to everyone in the community and they can be reeled off almost like a mantra. So to translate them, it would it is that Soon Gulap gentlemen are leaders, they love their friends, respect their elders, honor their teachers, are grateful to their parents, and look after their juniors. And in the next section, I want to look at how this collective identification, this Soon Gulap disease, um, and its attendant morality translates to real political patronage um, and how um, the study of Soon Gulap might help us understand something about Thailand's Byzantine political state. So before I do that, I just want to give a sort of brief um, theoretical outline of the, of the current state of the Thai political theorization. So nowadays, um, Macargo's theory of, of network monarchy is sort of, it sort of reigns supreme in the study of the Thai state. Many of you are probably quite familiar with it, um, but just to very briefly um, summarize it, this is a theory that supposes that King Bumiban, the former King Adulidet, um, here pictured on the right, constructed for himself an ingenious web of patronage that allowed him to directly intervene in domestic politics, despite being a constitutional monarch, ostensibly. Now, for our purposes, what is interesting is this man on the left. This is Brem Dinsulanon, and Duncan McCargo identifies Brem as the sort of linchpin, as the manager of this network monarchy. Now, Brem at various times in his career um, was prime minister. He was um, head of the army. And latterly, he was the president of the Privy Council. And according to McCargo, it was Brem's job to ensure that men loyal to the network monarchy were placed in strategic positions in the military, in the bureaucracy, in the legislature. Um, and th through his careful management of these disparate actors, um, network monarchy was able to oust several unelected prime ministers, um, at least three, who were deemed to be a threat to the uh, political monopoly or the resources of network monarchy. Now, um, I think network monarchies is a very useful theoretical tool, but even by Macargo's admission, it remains a very basic and simplistic sketch. More recently, Nishisaki, who is a, a, an analyst in Singapore, has observed that network monarchy really fails to show what kinds of people make up this rather amorphous network and how they're connected to each other. And his own analysis, Nishisaki's, in his latest book, Dynastic Democracies, shows that network monarchy was not built from scratch and that in fact it is founded on um, very highly convoluted kinship patterns that have emerged through generations of intermarriage between elite families. Um, and this is really important empirical um, evidence that helps us augment um, McCargo's theory. But even so, we're still kind of left to wonder about the quality of these social relations um, that structure this network. And importantly, we, we don't really get a sense of the important um, social and cultural work that goes into maintaining 
um, this network. And I think that the study of Soon Gulap is really helpful for this because it links the rather abstract theory of network monarchy with specific network monarchy and um, network institutions. It links it to um, specific identities, sites and embodied practices. Um, and I'm going to look now at um, why Soon Gulap might the study of Sungalap might help us understand something about network monarchy. So um, Bremtin Sulanon, pictured here on the left in his Sungalap jersey, is perhaps one of the most celebrated OSK in the school's history. He even has his own room dedicated to him in um, the school's museum. Uh, but interestingly, Brem only um, attended Sungulap for two years. Um, between 1936 and 1938, between the ages of 16 and 18. Uh, and when he was, and at this time he's enrolled in the 54th class, and that will be important for later on. Now, whenever Brehm writes about Sun Gulap in his personal uh, writings, he's always very effusive. And he notes that a lot of his personal morality was sort of permanently shaped by his time at Soon Gulap. So for example, he writes that um, Soon Gulap offered me love and unity and taught me how to know love for the group and protect the school's honor. In 1937, Bren went through um, something quite traumatic. His, his mother, beloved mother died very suddenly and because Bram was in the middle of his, his examinations in Bangkok, he couldn't return home to the Deep South for her funeral. And he describes his time as a sort of a colossal loss, a time of colossal loss in his life. Um, but at the same time, he found great solace in the Sungulat community around him. He says that Sungulat became his third parent. Now, Sungulat in the 1930s was famously strict. Pupils were flogged on a, on a near daily basis. But Brehm sort of found solace in this discipline and it helped somewhat with his bereavement. Um, and perhaps because Sungulat was so austere at this time, Bren writes that the experiences that him and his friend went through imbued all of them and all alumni of Soon Gulap with these sort of moral attributes, these personal characteristics of morality that would make them ideal candidates for public office. So, for example, he says that Soon Gulap took great pains to ensure pupils are disciplined, punctual and honest. He also writes that every teacher both Thai and Farang, were serious in teaching us to be good people. Kundi, um, if, for those of you familiar with modern Thai politics, you'll know that the phrase good people has very specific connotations, and particularly when uttered by someone like Brehm, um, because it's become a sort of rhetorical device, much used to legitimate the rule of an unelected faction, of an unelected but supposedly morally superior group of men, of good men. So perhaps unsurprisingly, considering his belief in the morality of his fellow alumni, Brehm was very good at maneuvering his members of his class, the 54th class, into positions of power. So Brehm entered the prime minister's office not elected, um, Brem never stood for election, in March 1980. Um, and at this point, he made several of his school friends, um, he gave them quite, some of them quite um, important offices of state. Um, I don't have time to go all through all of them now, but they are all in pink the men from the 54th class. And bear in mind, this the school is very small at this point. So his class would have only had 100 people or so. So um, quite a few of them made, them way, made their way into public office. But he also nurtured a lot of OSK who were outside of his immediate cohort, either younger or older. And I've pictured these in blue. Now, as I said, I don't have time to go through all of these, but I'd like to draw your attention to just three of these men who became really integral agents of network monarchy. So the first of them in blue is a man called Gramon Tongtamachar. 
And um, he was Brem's junior at OSK by 15 years. So they never studied together. But in 1980, when he became prime minister, Brem made Grammont his aide. And then three years later, he is a minister attached to prime minister's office. This was a favor. This was a position that he favored a lot um, to give to his OSK friends. And um, many years later, Grammont went on to become a political science professor at Sri Lankorn and a Supreme Court judge. According to Hadley, in 2001, Brehm was lobbying the Constitutional Court to acquit Prime Minister Taksin for concealing assets. At this time, it was thought Brehm wanted to kind of um, show goodwill to Taksin, to kind of bring him to heel, which clearly didn't work. So he needed Taksin to be acquitted. And according to Hand Handley, who wrote the King's biography, um, this acquittal was only secured after a last minute vote change by Grammont, who was sitting on the Constitutional Court. Um, another man that I want to draw your attention to is Surayut Dulanon, and he was Bre uh, Brem's aide de camp during his premiership. And many years later in 2006, when the network monarchy decisively moved against Taksin and staged a coup, um, Surayut was pretty much one of the main players in the coup. Um, he rallied the troops um, to um, execute the military push. And um, a few days later, he was also announced as prime minister. Um, he's also kind of Brem's successor. Brem died in 2019. And it was Surya, who was Brem's, who was mentored very intensively by Brem, who then took his place as president of the Privy Council. And he's still a very um, influential figure um, in Thai politics. And finally, um, another member of the 54th class is Siti Savetsila, who was um, Brem's li lifelong ally. When Brem became prime minister, he made Siti um, a foreign minister, a senator, and a deputy prime minister. Um, and then when Brem left office, Siti followed him to the Privy Council. Um, so according to um, documents published by WikiLeaks from the American embassy, it was City who was behind the legal coup that ousted the pro-taxing prime minister, um, Samak Suntawe in 2008. So we see that all three of these men, all from the Sungulap network, played important and high level roles um, in network monarchy. So we can see the relationship forged to Gulap, Gulap became the kind of building blocks of network monarchy. Um, I'm just going to briefly go through his here. I also want to make the point that this network was not limited to the men that I just mentioned. On the same month that Brehm became prime minister, he also announced the construction of a grand head, headquarters of the alumni, which was going to be built near his home on, um, on a plot bestowed by the Crown Property Bureau. And this was going to be a place, very large and ostentatious, a new physical space where alumni could um, relax and socialize and network. And um, yet by the time Brem left, left office, the sort of national reputation of Soon Glap was very high. So um, in 1988, during the school's 105th anniversary, it was actually broadcast live on television. Um, the event was so large. So um, at this time we can see during the Brem era, um, Sungula was undeniably an institution um, whose alumni enjoyed a sort of pipeline into power. And in this sense, I want to propose that Soon Gulab is a network institution um, for which I currently have the following working definition. So I, for me, a network institution would be an elite educational entity that invests significant material and symbolic resources to secure homosocial relationships characterized by moral obligation, emotional intimacy, and the mutual exchange of benefits in later life. Now, um, Thai politics is 
sort of characterized by the the push and pull of various networks and net and soon Gulab is not certainly not the only network institution that operates in Thailand, far from it. So I would include in the list of network institutions, a handful of other elite boys schools in Bangkok. So for example, Bangkok Christian, Tepsarin, Assumption, um, and a few others. And almost certainly the Jula Jumglao Military Academy and um, the Police Academy. We see throughout the history of modern Thailand that cohorts who studied together in some of these institutions um, took with them very important relationships which had uh, a very significant influence on um, the wider national politics of Thailand. What I want to do now is sort of shift gear a little bit and I want to talk about some of the cultural underpinnings of network politics. And specifically, I want to explore the idea that the close homosocial bonds that are forged at Soon Gulap, and which by extension help to maintain the struggle, the structural integrity of network politics, that they are actually a, an important part of Thailand's, Thailand's semi-colonial legacy. Now in my thesis, I describe in separate chapters um, the way in which colonial structures became incorporated into Sungalap's institutional culture. And I break these down into three separate periods, um, formalization, anglicization, and militarization. But today, I'm just going to briefly outline one of these periods, which is the period of anglicization, which occurred between 1894 and 1938. And my argument is this. Um, I want to complicate the popular notion that Thailand's elite network politics are solely ascribable to traditional ideas of kinship, like the Demaraja, or the accumulation of barami or moral charisma, um, or indeed that it is simply a modern reassertion of Satina feudalism. Rather, Thailand's network institutions operate through distinct cultural mechanisms, which were imported by a succession of six British headmasters who administered Sun Gulap um, between 1984 and 1938. And this is an era I call Anglicization. Uh, just for your interest here, um, Brehm is um, situated in the final row at the extreme left. And this was his graduating class, the 54th class. So during the period of Anglicization at Sun Gulap, the school was dominated by the graduates of a single British teacher training college, which was called Borough Road, which is located in Isleworth in North London. And, and these educators, who I'm gonna call the Borough Rodians, um, fundamentally transformed the institutional culture at Suan Gulap. And you can see on the left here, the Borough Rodians are the one, two, three, four, five, six headmasters who um, administered Suan Gulap, who were all graduates of the school. Below that are teachers who weren't headmasters at Suan Gulap, who also studied at um, Borough Road. Um, so before I get into the changes made at Soon Gulab, I want to just give you a very brief portrait of Borough Road itself, because I believe that understanding this institution is actually key to understanding what happened at Soon Gulab in the 1930s and the decades since. So Borough Road is a direct descendant of Joseph Lancaster's 18th century free school. And this was a single room institution um, that taught literacy and numeracy to the very poorest boys of South London. Now, by 1888, um, the first Sungulap headmaster, well, to be, um, arrived at Borough Road. His name was Ernest Young. He was from Middlesbrough, and he would have been 18 at the time. And when he arrived at Borough Road, 
the college was at a moment of critical change. So that year at Borough Road, um, an ex-pupil, um, well, th the principal had died and he was an ex-pupil called um, John Curtis. Now, Curtis was a bully and he was a brute. And the, the um, trainee teachers who were studying at the school at the time said that under Curtis, Borough Road was an unspeakably forbidding prison. Meal times were kept in silence. You couldn't leave the grounds and there was no intellectual stimulation. One contemporary um, remarked that Borough Road starved the minds of some of the cleverest men in England. Um, but Curtis's replacement was the polar opposite of the former headmaster. His name was P.A. Burnett and he was a young Oxford classicist who had studied at Oxford University. And um, Burnett believed that um, education must concern itself with the development of mind and appreciation of le leisure. And one of his first initiatives was to take Borough Road out of the slums of South London and re relocate it to Isleworth, to these big open fields. And here, Young and his peers were encouraged to engage in character building team sports. And a new esprit de corps emerged within the student body. So from February 1899, um, we see that Borough Road began to produce a monthly student paper uh, called the Bees Hums, that talked about the activities of students and alumni. The following year, the college adopted house colours, chocolate and white, and a new scho scholastic motto, una mente, or one mind. Um, and then it got a new emblem. And finally, um, old boy institutions started to crop up in some of the major cities of the UK, like Leeds, Birmingham, and London. And this is a picture of Borough Road in Isleworth on your left. Now, what's important to note here is that Burnett's reforms and his preoccupation with like esprit de corps and communal spirit were part of a much broader pedagogic shift that were taking place in Victorian London. So if we compare Victorian, um, Victorian College to the Georgian College, the Georgian College, Eton, Harrow, were very brutal places and they were characterized by frequent student uprisings. One scholar remarks that the Georgian College was a world of hard drinking, horse racing, gambling, blood sports, prize fighting, and sexual indulgence. But by the 19th century, this was beginning to change. New disciplinary procedures were coming in. Um, these schools had a dedicated game schedule. New rituals started to be introduced. And this is specifically because these new schools now had to function as the sorting house of empire. They had to produce the future administrators of this new British empire. And to this end, they had to create a new model of the boarding school boy. And he was a sort of a gentleman. He was a man of blameless character, reliable judgment and consistent behavior. He must be able to um, project an image of moral authority over vast populations. And unlike the Georgian schoolboy, this new ideal type was highly, um, had a great unwavering fidelity to their alma mater in a way that would have shocked previous generations. So for example, we have the cult of Harrow start to emerge, Harrow being um, a famous boys' school in North London, and they were expected to quote, love and worship the school. Or to also Rugby Winchester Charterhouse started to become much richer because alumni were suddenly donating so much money to their old schools. And these elite school networks started to reshape Britain's political landscape. So recruitment to London's male only members clubs began to be largely determined by where one went to school. Between 1886 and 1916, graduates of Eton and Harrow, just two small schools, accounted for 48% of cabinet ministers and top civil servants. Um, and you know, to date, Eton and Harrow have produced 27 prime ministers between them, just two small schools. 
Now, this might sound familiar to you if you are um, accustomed to the Thai political landscape. So Ernest Young and his fellow Bororodians, they were the beneficiaries of this very specific form of colonial education. And when they came to Suen Gulab in 1894, um, Young started to reformulate the school using Borough Road as his sort of ideological blueprint. And he really wanted to build an esprit de corps. At this time, there was a lot of absenteeism at the school, a lot of bullying, and students would drop out um, willy-nilly. You know, there was no sense of community at the school. So um, they started, first of all, to introduce games. So the Bororodians created Siam's first ever gym on campus, created the first ever Queensby boxing ring, and Siam's first international sized football fit pitch. And they also established an inter-school football tournament, Janturimit, between Soon Gulap and other elite boys. They had a very big game last Saturday, which was attended by thousands of people. That's still going. And, um, and this sort of gave the school an idea of friendly rivalry, but also a distinct identity. And this was helped by, um, by the symbolic language the school Bororodians began to craft. They repl replaced the school's original insignia um, with a new design, which was closer to the heraldic crest of the British school. Um, they had a new motto. They introduced the pink and blue colours. They also introduced um, the Suan Gulap, Wittia, which was a school newspaper. And um, as observed by Benedict Anderson, these kind of communal literary spaces of exchange and interaction are really essential for constructing an imagined community. So, for example, in the magazine, students were encouraged to identify with students who had studied many years prior, even in the palace school. So in 1931, when an OSK died in England at an REF base during um, a routine flying training, um, the students were told to line up at uh, Hua Lampong train station when his ashes were to be repatriated. And they started to feature obituaries of old um, Sun Gulab. This kind of extended the idea of the community back through time, um, which was really helped by Prince Damrong's article in 1926 called Damnan Sun Gulab, which um, documents the process that he went through to found the school. And this kind of serves as the, as the school, the community's foundation story. And it's often reprinted, especially in the, cremator, the cremation volumes of Sun Gulab alumni. Um, also, this affected the school's um, curriculum. The school started to have subjects um, that introduced by the Borodians that wouldn't have looked out of place if for an imperial functionary. They started to be tested on, in 1920, the test featured advanced calculus, French translation, ancient Egypt, the merits of Zoroastrianism, the Battle of Marathon, Japanese culture and the teachings of Confucius. So not surprisingly, Soon Gulak began to dominate the, the um, school's results boards. And every year when Soon Gulak did very well, the Borodium sent the students out dressed as British gentlemen to announce to the passersby how well the school had done. And this invested the school and its community with a sense of being the best of the best, that they were my wrong cry, they weren't second to anyone. This is something that um, Soon Gulap still say to this day, Soon Gulap is number one. And it gave the school a real sense of identity. Um, let me just go back. I'm going to finish up soon. Um, I'm going to have to miss some things out because I'm running out of time. Um, but you can see that successive Bororodian administrators constantly, consciously cultivated specifically colonial configuration of communal sentiments. And they did so through the power of team sports, um, communal literary spaces, um, um, glorifying community success, and constructing an institutional symbology that dates back through time. Um, I'm gonna to have to leave it there because I've overrun my time. And I really wanna hear your questions. So um, thank you very much for listening. Um, well, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation, Daniel.
So the uh, we have two comments. Usually I would open up the thing uh, with a question, but I see that uh, Kung Sacha has, uh, has has asked basically the same thing I was going to ask, which we'll get to in a second. So first of all, we have BC who's made a comment that they're an alumni of this school and they can give you insider opinion. That's probably something for your future research to make contact with Wonderful. them. Thank you very them. much. Yes, please um, get in touch with me. <laughs> for Kung Sacha's uh, uh, comment, I would question, I'm breaking it into two parts. First of all, are there rival network institutions to this that get into conflict with this network? And if so, how do they resolve that network in, uh, um, that helps in such a way that helps to keep the, uh, maintain the integrity of the entire structure? Another way to put that is, does this make Thailand stronger actually? Um, does it make Thailand stronger? That's an interesting um, point. I would say that, yes, there are absolutely, I think with the, time limit here, I perhaps overemphasized the um, solidarity with a sort of network institution and Soon Gulap. Soon Gulap actually has produced alumni of an extraordinary ideological breadth, and um, they have also been political rivals. If we, for example, go back to Brem in 1980s, um, so Nanakon, who was his deputy prime minister, Oh, no, he was his head of the army, actually betrayed Brem very badly. And this was because he had aligned himself to the Young Turks, who were a rival network coming out of the Jula Junglao Military Academy. They were part of the seventh class. So these um, networks are kind of clashing against each other all the time. And frankly, one of the ways that they get resolved is often by coup, um, whether military, legal, or through uh, manipulation of um, legislation. Um, but yes, certainly um, there is a lot of division in the Sunglak community, and that has been exacerbated by the rise of the internet. And one of the things I talk about more in my research is how the school has really stepped up, and the alumni, the amount of rituals that have um, the amount of rituals that have emerged during this time, particularly since the fall of Taksin, when Thailand in general has become much more um, divisive, has been exponential. So primarily these are papered over, these differences with ritual and rhetoric. And that's something I talk about in, in my book a little bit. We have two more uh, questions, but I'm going to take the, the last one first because the, the next one is quite lengthy. So the the quicker question is from Wasani. Um, hi, may I know the number of people participating today? And if you mean the number of people in the seminar, it's 104 people in the audience, but I suspect it's how many people are in this network. Oh, in this network? Well, um, I, well I, what I did in the presentation is I just took out the top players of Brem's network, but the Soon Gulap network didn't die with Brem or indeed with the uh, Monarch. So um, just here is a picture of uh, before the last general election. And this was a plenary that the school hosted. So you can see sat here, um, they're all OSK, the CEO of the energy conglomerate Bang Jack, a former deputy, deputy prime minister, the incumbent deputy prime minister, a former election minister, uh, public intellectual, a, a Thai TV host. And um, after the election, um, at least one of these men and several of the OSK became part of the new administration. Um, so it's always changing, it's always moving and it is realigning. It's hard to put a figure on it, but I would say that the feeling of brotherhood, of the sense of a shared destiny and morality is shared by an extraordinary amount of OSK members. Even OSK who don't necessarily join in with many alumni events, I didn't meet a single participant who said they weren't proud to have attended the school or to be an OSK. So to put a number in it would be very difficult, um, but certainly they are spread throughout um, public life. The question we have from Eric White, uh, I presume that homosocial 
socialization and habitus has been central to not only elite high schools, military academies and police academies, but other exclusive elite educational institutions in Thailand, such as, for example, Songhai universities, law schools, and secular universities. I have two questions. Despite these similar institutional logics, do we find distinct repertoires of cultural values, social skills, and behavioral dispositions cultivated within these different settings? And two, how has rising gender equality and elite education impacted, if at all, the reproduction of this homosocial habitus and its network elaboration? Mm, okay, so I'll, I'll take the first part um, first. It's a good idea. Um, okay, so um, essentially we're saying um, we could probably extend um, network institutions to include um, elite universities. I would say, yes, you're probably right. However, one of the things that I got a sense of during all my research, which is perhaps quite different from, let's say, the British um, or Anglo sphere, is that Thai people in general, particularly ones who went to elite school, tend to stay, have very strong social relationships with the people that they attended high school with. And they're already set. And by the time they get funneled into an elite university, they don't tend to change that much. You don't see, as in England, really strong bonds being made at university in the same way. Um, my caveat for that would be these um, military academies, which so are sort of like universities, where because of the intensity of the experience, you do get, and probably some rituals that I'm not aware of, you do that very intense bonding. Um, I would say that, well, one of the ways that um, gender, um, let's say, equality as it's grown in Thailand, has affected the school is that now, as differently to before, the vast majority of faculty at the school are female. The school has even had its own um, headmistress, who is a, a very influential headmistress, Ajahn Samai Wanata Siri. And... Um, but generally, I would say that it probably hasn't affected um, the Soon Gulap Brotherhood itself too much because it is a, a very homosocial um, space, albeit one now which has many um, female members, honorary members who are teachers um, or retired teachers, but may not necessarily, um, there might not be this, there isn't the same kind of horizontal idea of peer-to-peer -peer relations um, as there would be between OSK graduates. Um, it's a much more hierarchical uh, relationship between students and teachers. Um, but it is definitely something to think about and something that I would like to explore in future research. Um, the, the gendered aspect mm -hmm. of it is um, something that's very interesting. So thank you for the question. We have had a rush of questions, so I'm going to try to take three of them at a time. Uh, we have a comment for Rachel Harrison. Thanks for a very for a really interesting presentation. A comment here that the experience of the early Thai novelist Kru Liam is very interesting here. He left Borough Road as a result of a nervous breakdown caused by bullying. If I recall correctly, he then went to teach at Suwon Kalap at a very young age. I'm still struggling to accept that the Suwon Kalap experience is different from that of other institutions. Then Vichar asks, is there a female counterpart of Suwon Kalap in OSK? And then Anna asks, um, how is the construction of masculinity in Suwon Kalap play into the network institutions and Thai politics at large? How does this construction affect queer students there? What kind of ideologies about gender are being promoted at elite or all boys schools like Suwon Kalap? Okay, very good. Um, let me go back to the first question which what can you remind me Michael quickly of the first question sorry okay the first one is about the bullying of the uh the author crew Liam oh, yes so went, Liam. You know, oh yes he was he was hardly buried in Bourne school oh uh, was it Borough Road yeah Borough Road. Actually, what, was it Borough Road okay uh, yeah I think he had a blanket thrown out over him and by some bullies and yeah he had no respect down um um Yes, I would say that there are what I didn't have time to. There's a lot of more connections between Borough Road and Sungulap, in, including students who were at Sungulap who then went to study at Borough Road. I would say that um, I unfortunately haven't been able to, in this presentation, give a flavor of why the experience at Sungulap is so singular. Um, but I would think a lot of OSK would say that it is, and that is primarily because of these very singular 
um, rituals that they go through. So for example, before you even come an OS, become an OSK, before, before you're 12 and you've been accepted, you have to go through a three-day initiation in the jungle of, of Chumbury, um, where you go through various um, rituals and activities. Um, and there's just such a, a level of rhetoric there, and it feeds into other ideas of the good people, so much so that, you know, Sungulat people, um, students do kind of set themselves aside from the students of other um, institutions. Um, I think it's a really interesting point made about um, queer students' experiences. I did talk to quite a few um, Gatoi or transgender students at Soon Gulab, and they had quite different experiences. So, for example, I talked to one couple who met at Soon Gulab, and since one of them has transitioned, um, and they've been happily married for 15 years. Um, and they, they said they never experienced any problems when they were students. A lot of the boys have semi-secret um, homosexual um, relationships when they're at the school. It's not that unusual, as it is, I, I imagine, for quite a few old boys' schools. Um, but then I also met some people who said it was horrible. And, for example, there are one um, transgender student I talked to, she was a member of lots of group chats on um, on the message boards of um, of Line, which is a popular application in Thailand. And um, there was some like a lot of um, um, chats that were recommending massage parlors, and there was a level of misogyny that she sort of withdrew from, and it and it then stopped her going um, and and becoming part of the continue to be part of the alumni community. But then again, at these big alumni events, you will see beautiful women there. Um, and they were all old students who've since um, transitioned and that still feel very comfortable going back to the school and joining these um, communal activities. We have uh, probably too many, too, uh, the number of questions we have are probably out, out, will out you the time you have left, but, but some quick ones. Uh, uh, do you think the network like this will last among the younger generation? And is the access equal to everybody? Is it, it comes from all social backgrounds, geographic and social, or is access limited? Well, um, I, this is a very important question. That I'm going to be addressing in the last chapter. The internet really has changed the game quite a lot. And you'll see now, for example, there's a really popular Facebook page called Nakri and Sun Gulab. And this is set up anonymously by members of the school community who are sort of, uh, who love the school, but are quite critical of its extremism sometimes and its political, political conservatism. And that page has 250,000 members. And you'll see now um, in the 2001 protests, a lot of the, some of the protests were actually, um, sort of linking together through these networks. So the networks were being used to kind of take down established and um, political structures. So it will be very interesting, I think, to see if these networks do um, cling on and how they evolve and emerge um, with new practices. Certainly a core of older alumni are very adamant that this um, these networks should continue. Um, yeah, can you just remind me again, Michael, of one of the other questions? The other one was uh, the uh, uh, do, do you think it lasts? Folks, which one did you answer? Because they're both related to the same thing. Do you think it's going to last? And uh, is this access open to everybody? I think you well, answered, access, this, yeah. Well, yeah, so the access is interesting. Like when I was last at the school, um. So it is open to everyone, essentially, as long as you pass the test um, to get in. And um, I, but I remember when I was at one of the camps last year, and they said, put your hand up if you're privately educated. And probably 99% of the students put their hands up. And that's because I think the test is quite hard. And it would be perhaps challenging for some students who didn't have that extra academic help to get in to the school. But that being said, there is very little snobbery within the school. When it was in the palace and early in, early on, we talk about students give testimonies of being victim to huge amounts of snobbery and, uh, and social exclusion. But what has happened now is I think that the school successfully strips students of their 
um, pre-existing social class and sort of rebuild its own meritocracy, um, um, which some of the other schools do in Thailand using these sort of rituals and um, rhetorics and symbols. So in some ways it is kind of egalitarian, in some ways not. We have uh, Nata. Uh, I have two questions. Does the concept of Raksha Sawat, uh, which emphasizes the principle of serving the king and monarchy, feature prominently in the narrative of SK? And then, in light of the recent backlash surrounding the, uh, excuse my reading of this, uh, Jaduramidom, is that right? Because they only have it in Thai. Uh, football match. In oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The okay. Uh -huh. uh, do you believe that the OSK network will undergo transformation or experience a decline in popularity among the younger generation? Okay, interesting. I think um, definitely um, this idea that Sungu Lab was founded essentially to um, educate people to serve the king or the monarchy is something that has um, is very important um, in, to the sort of collective psychology of the school. So um, actually, if you look at the 1930s, the graduates of the palace school didn't want anything to do with the new school outside the palace. They thought the two were completely separate. They had nothing to do with this modern school. And that's why they are pretty much absent when the Alumni Association was founded in the 1930s by the Borough Rodians. Um, but what we see later on, as the rise of monarchy got more and more pronounced from the 1970s, that this idea that the school is absolutely linked to King Charles Longcorn and to the monarchy, that it is the sort of survival of the bureaucratic state is dependent on Soon Gulat churning out moral men, is a really um, deep rooted and and deeply felt sentiment in the school. And it is often repeated in different ways, not least through this sort of a massive, um, um, sort of almost worship of Brem as the ultimate embodiment of this notion. And with him having his own um, exhibit in the school, I think students are sort of very much encouraged to emulate Brem as the sort of ultimate royal subject. Yeah, so it, to answer your question, it, it is very important, I think. The Danta um thing, actually, I have to admit, I haven't really been paying too much attention to it because it's only very recently happened, but it is something that I'm going to look into and ask some people about. But I do know there's been a lot of controversy about the uh, what goes on there in terms of political messaging. So that's something that I'm going to look into. Thank you for pointing that out to me. The questions are still continuing, but maybe I think because of time, we should only take one more. Um, okay. So I got a question from Tomas uh, Larson. Thanks for uh, a fabulous presentation. I wonder if you could elaborate on the religious dimensions of Suwon Kalab educational philosophy and sociality. Can one be a good person of the Suwon Kalab kind if one lacks religiosity? That is, that is so interesting. A very good question. I mean, what we what historians have pointed to traditionally is that your morality in sort of pre-modern times, let's say, your morality um, is sort of bound up by your accumulation of karma, which was sort of accumulated through your adherence to sort of Buddhist values. What we have in the 1930s is sort of a slight secularization of this idea of morality and goodness. And it was very much actually promoted by OSK graduates. Probably the most significant would be um, Son Bakpuri, which was a pamphlet created by um, Bia Malagun, who was a, a student at the school. And essentially, they yeah, they sort of secularized morality. So while it still retained um, a Buddhist sort of component to it, um, all of a sudden it was quite interested in how you spoke, how you presented yourself in public, how you interacted with superiors and inferiors. And it sort of soaked up a lot of um, Victorian morality that was circulating in Britain at the time. So while certainly the 
ties will say, yes, it is fundamentally rooted in Buddhism. And I think that's true. Um, that doesn't mean that this notion of morality hasn't shifted over time until now. And actually, interestingly, the architects of those shifting morals were often graduates of soon collapse. They sort of, um, in very, in many ways, they kind of, um, they have constructed a lot of the moral landscape of, of modern Thailand. Well, well, thank you very much. Uh, this has been a very good, and thanks to all of you who have questions and apologize, and I apologize for those we can't accommodate. Yeah, uh, can I just right say actually, um, if I go back to this page here, it has my um, email address on, it's oh, dw30 good, yeah. at soas.ac.uk. And I would just love um, to hear any of your thoughts and ideas and questions and um, be really greatly appreciated. So thank you for that. Okay. So thank you, um, Daniel, for your talk. Uh, we, we, we're remote, so we can't really give a, a, a clap ovation, but I think you would get a certainly a very strong uh, ovation for this. Um, uh, well, thank you again for giving your talk, and this will be recorded and put onto YouTube for those of you who would like to refer to it in the future, and we will call this uh, to a close. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, and thank you for attending. Bye.